we're talking about weed control and, and multiple fruit plantings. And, uh, and I know a number of you have probably every fruit in the room is probably uh, represented. The, um, the, it's really important. Weed control is very important, especially in those establishment years. And then those also takes um, peaches and the stone fruits that are fairly shallow rooted. If you don't have that weed free zone around that, uh, I like to have at least five foot, uh, two and a half foot on each side of whatever you're planting, uh, you're going to be impacted. Your yield will be impacted, and the quality of your fruit can be impacted too, as well as harbor diseases and insects. You know, just the whole overall health of the orchard can be um, really uh, go downhill quickly if we can't keep weeds under control. Also, I know over here on the shore and, and on the both shores, the southern shore and the western shore um, of Maryland, uh, southern Maryland area, and here on the shore, um, this new weed, Palmer amaranth. How many of you have seen it? You do not want to let this one go unnoticed in, in any, anywhere. Uh, and so you don't want it in your orchard either. It's completely resistant to three different uh, chemistries. And it will quickly overcome um, your, uh, whatever you're planting uh, without having at least a herbicide strategy. The, um, and we look at resistance development over time. We've got about 37 different species now um, that are resistant to glyphosate. And some of these are multiple resistance uh, to ALS and PPOs and so it's really critical that we pay attention to these resistant weeds out there. So if you're spraying Roundup on something that's not killing it, more than likely you've got a resistant weed and then management gets a little bit diff more difficult. This is a picture of pigweed, Palmer amaranth. Uh, that's how prolific the seed is. So if it goes unnoticed and you spread it across the field, it looks just like, you know, I couldn't have sowed it better than that. <laughs> and that's thankfully, I mean, for th that's a corn and they were actually able to rescue that corn. Uh, what product would they use? Anyone know? They would use dicamba probably, or 2,4-D dicamba would, uh, would have been probably the product that they used to take that, because that's sulfonylure resistant uh, too. So, and AL, so the ALS inhibitors won't work, Roundup won't work, and PPOs are still work in Maryland, but that could be short-lived. But anyway, dicamba will take it out, so you can put dicamba over corn, and they actually did rescue that field. But you don't always get that kind of strategy uh, in everything that you plant where you have these rescue treatments. So keep that in mind. That's what it can look like if you let that weed get out of hand. So pay attention to Palmer amaranth. Uh, real quickly, um, it has a smooth stem. Smooth pigweed has a hairy stem, but Palmer does have a smooth stem, so there's no hairs on the stem. Its petiole, if you spread it over the, the length of the leaf blade itself, um, is longer. So that's a really a good clue for Palmer amaranth. And it's got kind of a poinsettia look when it grows, so it's a little bit different than some of the pigweeds. It really does have a a very uniform poinsettia type growth habit when it's young. And that's when you want to kill it before it gets six inches tall. So you really want to be out there working on this weed early. You don't want to let it go to seed. It has male and female seed heads. And again, more than a half million seeds. Some people say quite a bit more than that per plant. So it's a pretty amazing plant from that standpoint. The, um, some of the things, just to remind you that uh, we're looking at these FRAC uh, codes, our, our HRAC, Herbicide Resistant <coughs> Action Committee codes, right? RACs. So you have you have HRAC, FRAC, and IRAC, right? Not countries, but these resistant action committees. And herbicides, uh, if you go WSSA with Weed Science Society of America was the first to nomenclature these numbers that you see uh, associated with the different chemical families. And as we go through the slides, I want you to pick up on that number because I want you to think about rotating chemistry. Uh, if you're like me, typically what happens is you uh, kind of you get your favorite products and you just keep using them. And then of course, when you use your favorite products repeatedly, you're gonna have a whole different weed spectrum to, to think about that's somewhat immune or maybe developing resistance to the weeds that you're encouraging to grow by selecti selectivity. So moving through these families is very critical. And so I'll show you some of the different families that you have opportunity to use. And I do put out this little multi-fruit sp um, spray sheet and I kind of list in there, I have a one side tree fruit, the other side turn it over, it's, it's small fruit. And uh, it's packed with a lot of information, but it does put those frac codes in there. And there's, I pulled out the herbicide list out of that uh, little spray sheet. And you can see I have some pretty nice little notes in there. When I like to use these products, um, it's fall versus summer, you know, dormant only, uh, up till fruiting, uh, with some of the PHIs on it, uh, pre-harvest intervals. And also the, the low rate, which I typically recommend that you use the low rate, especially if you're on sandy soils until you're familiar with the products, or if you're starting out on a young orchard or, or vineyard or planting. So anyway, that's the low rate um, with some notes, and then also the, the herbicide resistant action codes are on there too. So anyway, that might be helpful for you. It's always been helpful for me when I go into the chem room. Um, 
it's kind of like a, oh gosh, what am I spraying today? <laughs> so, so it's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, sometimes um, you want to have a little bit more thought process and maybe some guides to help you. Also put together a little vineyard. Uh, uh, Joe Fiola asked me to, to talk about dormant, dormant and fall applications. So I put a little uh, guide that would equally fit a number of the, the fruits too for vineyards as to some of the products that uh, with the same kind of um, uh, for mainly more looking at more fall and dormant applications. So I do, I do have preferences and everyone does with their chemistry and what time of the year they like to use them. So we'll talk about that as we go through a little bit. For those that do organic, I do put an organic substitution in there. Um, I've used a couple of these. I love Avenger. Anyone use Avenger? It smells wonderful. Actually, it works pretty well. Two applications will get you pretty close to a gramoxin application if you've got succulent weeds that are, that are small. Uh, very pricey, though. It can cost you easily $400 per acre to put those two, two applications on. So you got to really have a high-value crop <laughs> or just do spot spraying, right, uh, and be, you know, because it really is very expensive. Of course, if you're just spraying the fruit zone, uh, you know, you're, you're really already you're getting down to something that might be more manageable, maybe two applications for $150. <laughs> so, Mike. Do you think that is agrobiosin still on your fruit? Um, which, ah. Yeah, that's a good question. I, that, that's probably a good question, Mike. I, yeah, I, I think it's an exception. I think you have to. You can't just use it automatically. Um, you have to seek an exception to use that. Yeah. So some with, same with coppers too. You can't automatically just use coppers. As people do, but you really are supposed to seek exceptions on some of these products. Yeah. But they can be used. You have to basically prove the case. That's the exception. You have to contact MDA and say nothing else is going to work, and so I've got to use uh, some of these products. The um, uh, axe and scythe are the same chemical, pelargonic acids. And uh, Axe is the only one now with the army label. Scythe does not have the army label. It's a little more concentrated product. And I think the danger, you notice it's got a warning on there, not caution, um, is because that acid is very, uh, you get it in your eyes, it's very detrimental to your, to your eyes. Uh, so again, and the burnout product, uh, this one here is a citric acid clove oil product. Burnout also comes in acetic acid formulations too. I think it's burnout too. And so, the acetic acid constant, once you get above 12% acetic acid, you can actually do permanent eye damage. So that doesn't mean these things are necessarily safe uh, to, for the user standpoint. They're safe once you put them out in the environment, um, but from the user standpoint, they could be, and that's, you see burnout has a danger label. That means it's probably going to burn your eyes pretty bad when you get into a danger label. That means you can get permanent cataracts if you get this the full strength in your eye, okay? It might have to have corneal surgery re replacement corneal. So, I mean, that's... That's, that's something to think. And of course, you can do the same thing with gramoxin, right? You can put gramoxin in your eye and do the same thing. So we got to be careful out there. That's, that's the main thing. So um, this axe is, takes an awful lot of product, too, to get to these percent solutions that's required to really get good burn down. But they do do a great job. Um, Ed Bestie, a former weed scientist here at the uh, University of Maryland, put me on to the pelargonic acid and said, hey, that's his favorite when it comes to burning something down. And, and really, one application can get you pretty, especially at the high end rates. Of course, that's a lot of product and pretty expensive and um, uh, can get you up to a burn down chemical equivalent to uh, gramoxin at these high end rates. And so, again, on young weeds, you're not going to kill perennials with this. You'll burn them back a little bit, but you're not going to kill them. You're going to have to get young weeds with that. And you can, um, you know, use that. Um, of course, the old standards, gramoxin, there has been some um, label changes to gramoxin. There's been concerns about gramoxin coming off the marketplace totally, uh, especially for any hand applications or, or small gator type applications and so uh, I'm hoping that's not going to happen but it's going to be up to us to do a good job out there and get the safety factor do a better job on the safety side. Gramoxin is deadly uh, it is the only herbicide that I know that has that the danger plus the uh, skull and crossbones on it and how many use Gramoxin? I mean to me it's the best burn down product there is I've been using it since the 80s and uh, it's just a wonderful thing it's what made no-till no-till what it is um, no, the no-till revolution the problem is, is once you get a lethal dose, there's no, there's no going backwards. If you get a lethal dose of gramoxin, you will die five to seven days. They'll put you in an induced coma. It sounds terrible, doesn't it? It's just an agonizing thing to even consider. Um, so, and you can get it through skin absorption. Um, so that's why uh, we have to be very concerned. But it's a great burn down product. The chemical plow, or chemical disc, if you will, burns everything, the vegetation off close. It's great to put in with your uh, Pre-emergence products, you know, your, your long active uh, products that will give you that seasonal control. Typically, I, I spray my orchards three times, vineyards up to five times a year, and gramoxin's typically in there every time, right? It's kind of like that burn down product. But you could, that's, uh, wait, not, you have to use non-ionic surfactants, and you have to be, there's the, some of the label changes are on these spot and tank mixtures that we do when we go out.
typically if we're making hand applications or wand applications or directed spray applications off a tractor rig. Um, sometimes we're more exposed in vineyard uh, fruit applications. They have a, uh, a dilution range that you can't go beyond. So you have to have a fairly diluted product in that tank mix, but it's still a very effective uh, tank mix. So pay attention to those mixture uh, ranges that you're allowed. That's some label changes, as well as the requirement for a um, uh, Dorn spray, and of course they've always had these requirements for respirators, but they've kind of beefed up the, uh, make sure you look at the uh, respirator and required um, uh, PPE uh, for Gramoxin. You'll notice that it doesn't require an organic um, charcoal vapor. That's because Gramoxin does not, it's, it's not volatile at all. It's a very heavy molecular chemistry, and it stays, in, and the only way you can really breathe it is with the mist. It's not kind of off-gassing like some of these other products we have where you actually are smelling the product. You're not really smelling. You're smelling a stench agent in Gramoxin that off-gasses, but you're not smelling the actual chemical. So that's uh, something to think about. So with the dust mask, that's all you need. It's just something to avoid breathing the mist. That's all you need. With, but that's important, so don't forget not to wear that because if you do breathe the mist, uh, you know, it doesn't take too much of that Gramoxin to really do a lot of damage, especially direct damage to your lungs mucus pathways and things. So very, very important that we pay attention to Gramoxin. Of course, Roundup, that's the chemical plow. And uh, I'd say be very cautious Roundup, especially around young plantings. Um, and always avoid uh, uh, too much saturation with these new surfactants that they have in this Roundup technology. It's easy to get movement in through green tissue, bud tissue. Even some of these woods down there on the woody tissues uh, will, will soak up the Roundup. And if it gets down there into that into that phloem, into that vascular system of that plant, it will translocate and you're gonna see injury. And so Roundup, the most self-inflected injury that I've seen in, by all any of us is probably Roundup. So be very, very careful with Roundup. But it can be done. I say you really probably should use a shielded sprayer uh, with Roundup. And uh, here's just an example of Roundup through a little fescue field where we threw the beech plums in. And uh, so you can see that's all that was necessary was just one application of Roundup. I did put a little bit of Devron all in there, but but you can see that gave us enough chance to start those beach plums pretty, pretty easily in that. So kind of a no-till approach to beach plum planting. Anyone plant beach plums? They're actually pretty, yeah, they're really great. They grow, they grow very well and require much less fungicides to, to grow them. So how the process of trying to process them and sell them, that might be a little bit different. The uh, Rely, another good burn down product. So we're kind of looking at the burn down products. These are the ones that are going to kill the vegetation uh, with the uh, pre emergence products that you're going to use. Um, so this is kind of the last one Rely chemical chisel. It has a little bit of uh, systemic activity, not much, not like Roundup. Uh, that's why we use it for sucker control and different things like that because it won't go into the main tissue of the plants. It's a very limited translocation. Um, but it's a very good product. It's really good for things like mare's tail, and I don't know if you have some of these broadleaf weeds that we have some trouble with, so Rely is a very good one. And it has a um, uh, uh, fairly short, uh, I think, uh, for some crops, fairly short uh, PHI. So here's just a picture of uh, taking, beach, uh, taking the peaches out, took the um, uh, grubber and grubbed out all the roots and, and worked the area up so the peaches would have continued down through the center there. And you can see, you put the, uh, you can see we planted some apples, high-density apples, doing a little study with fire blight up at Upper Marlboro. And you can see come back, that's 14 days later. Now the grass is greened up and we can see the herbicides are working in the herbicide zone, right? So then you take another, come back another 10 days and it doesn't look too bad, does it? So a nice transformation, uh, putting those apples down the old drive row and real quickly getting in back into an apple block uh, uh, just within, you know, 30 days. So, so man, it can be done out there. And of course the herbicides make life a lot easier. As a weed scientist, you know, even later in the season, you know, keeping that's the same that's the same block as we got into into bearing. You know, uh, with apples, they're they're more deep rooted. I'm not quite as concerned about competition as I am with peaches and the stone fruits, and so I do have a, I do let a little bit more grass and things grow. But you can see it's easy to burn that out uh, when, with that. So let's talk a little bit real quick about some of the chemistry. And uh, again, uh, these uh, um, dinitroanilins they've been around forever. Um, Recently, we've got some relaxation on the Prow, uh, Prow H2O. Uh, Prow H2O, uh, pendomethylin, and, uh, and surflan or isolin, again, both di dinitroanilins in that, in that uh, family of number three. And of course, the old treflan was probably where we started. How many remember treflan? It's still labeled for fruit. Uh, it, it's one that really gasses off quickly, so you have, to, you have to till that in or water treflan in. It can be applied as a granular, watered in if you have a sprinkler sets or a light, light uh, disking would, would be fine or, or harrowing. And um, 
they, they do have, uh, they're really great on grass control. So they really are good grass control products. I like all these products in the spring of the year. First of May is a really good time for that to, to just knock those grasses out. And they do a pretty good job on small seeded, um, especially um, prowl and even surf land, um, pigweeds, lamb quarters, those kind of things, those small seeded broadleaf weeds, right? So that's a good starting place. Surf land is, has um, basically a zero uh, PHI where, where you have to watch prowl. You got 60 days till harvest. <clears throat> So be careful with that. <clears throat> and uh, again, they have limited activity for about a month of really good activity. And that's all we really typically get out of most of these products is about six to eight weeks. Uh, but it will stick around, especially Prowl, a little bit longer. So that's why Prowl has been a nice one that's been added for, ad, added for us. The, um, and again, Surfland in blueberries is a nice way to go. Um, one thing nice about dinitroanilin is they're bound by soil very tightly. And so if you're worried about a shallow root system and a very fine shallow root system like blueberries, um, it's nice to know that that surf land is going to stay up in that soil. Make sure you have soil there and don't have just pure organic matter, though, because then the surf land could end up in the root zone, uh, especially, um, and I would avoid prow with, I don't think prow is labeled for blueberries, but I would be very careful with that one. Um, uh, Cacheron, that's an old product. Uh, again, another class of chemistry um, in the, um, uh, uh, it's a diclobenol. And it's interesting because this one has to be watered in. It's typically a granular product. Anyone use that one? It's a really good product because um, it inhibits uh, germination, really affects germinating seedlings. Um, and basically, if you time it right uh, and put this product on, you'll, you'll see a nice control period where you won't get anything to germinate. So it's a very nice product in that. But it does have to be watered right into that root zone of those. And so there's a little bit of finesse there to get casseran right where you want it in that root zone. And sometimes if you get six inches of rain, sandy ground, oh well. <laughs> you all bets are off then, right? So again, sometimes things are out of our control. Um, but a very good product. Of course, these are the ones that uh, Carmex, the diurons and the turbosils, um, Carmex diuron, which is the generics, and then um, and then Synbar, um, the photosynthetic ureas inhibitors. Um, these these chemicals um, are really good in the dormant, and you really got to watch. Uh, you want to have your orchards well established before you use these products, and you're going to want to watch sandy ground too, especially with Carmex, and uh, you know make sure you don't get some of these into those root zones. Um, you will see the yellowing, the typical um, um, intravenal chlorosis if you do get some of these products in. Um, but they, are, they do have fairly long soil activity, so a great thing to follow in the fall to basically keep you know, that um, weed encroachment down going into the next spring. You know, Maryland, we have plenty of time, uh, especially when look, it's supposed to go to 80 today, break all kinds of records. Uh, the, um, we have plenty of time for weeds to grow. Uh, up until Christmas and then, you know, from this time forward, they're growing pretty well. So sometimes these dormant applications can really help you um, get ahead of some of the problems like mare's tail and some of these things that we have out there. Um, and they do have a, a, a little bit better spectrum of broadleaf control. So that's why I like the Carmaxes. Used to lot, used to use a lot of these uh, typical products um, when I was an alfalfa farmer. <laughs> the, um, Looking at the, uh, um, the Devernols, the, probably the safest of all products. So that's kind of your, that's where you start out when you're just learning to spray <laughs> because you're less likely to injure crops with Devernol than any of them. Devernol is in the acid amide family, which is dual. Dual is in the acid amide family. Of course, you can't use dual, but you can use Devernol. And Curb, Curb also is in that acid amide, amide family, uh, Pronamide. And those, these two products also are uh, shoot inhibitors, and they got about one month of good activity most, most of the time. And I like Devernol because you can put it right up, you know, this can be a late season application. They're very good at grasses. Again, they catch some of those, especially Curb will do some pretty good jobs on the, uh, um, some of those broadleaf weed problems too. And Curb's another one you can use uh, in the fall or in the dormant period. And Devernol, any time of the year, great for starting fruit. So Devernol, Devernol Gramoxin or Devernol, one of the organics, if you want to fool with them, would be a great way to go uh, with good safety margin. There's a picture of of uh, early on in the vineyard with some Devernol and, uh, and, and Gramoxin. So again, good, good spring and time of the year uh, products. Princep is uh, one that you're going to want to make sure that uh, you only have a well-established orchards and vineyards to use this. I like to have three-year-old orchards and vineyards before we start using Princep. Princep also, you got to watch pH. Make sure the pH never goes above seven. And make sure you're, uh, or you're going to have extremely high activity of your Princep. It's kind of a releases the pH, the high pH almost releases the activity of simazine. Simazine is a triazine. The triazine family, we don't have too many uh, to pull from. So that's what makes Princeps so valuable. 
it's a really good large seeded broadleaf control product. So if you have morning glory problem, or some of these big seeded broadleaf weeds, jimson weed, uh, velvet leaf, bur, bur, uh, um, bur cucumber, some of these different big seeded broadleaf weeds, then, then pin, Princeps is going to be the answer to that. And you, it's only dormant only, so you got, you got a small window. Now's the time to be putting Princeps down. All right, and you're, uh, so right now, Princep would be perfect. And, uh, and again, three-year-old, and make sure you know your soil. Um, if you've got a pretty high sand and you put Princep on it, if it gets in the root zone, you will see it. And you will, damn, you will injure your, your crop. You, you will lose crop yield. Uh, if you see fluorescence of Princep in the canopy, uh, you, you've lost crop yield. And so if you get that in the root, root zone, that's critical. Now, one thing about Princep, it's 10, 10 times um, less water soluble um, than atrazine. So it does take quite a bit of rain to get it flushed down. But if you have high sands, stay on that low rate and make sure it's well-established orchard and vineyard, right, before you put that out there. How many use Princep? Really good product. Uh, again, if you have broadly problems or you've got the <coughs> constant morning glory trying to creep up everything, that's the one you want to add. And so here's a Princep application in the spring uh, with Gramoxin. And uh, again, nice time of the year before get it on there before you go into uh, to bloom. Solacan, that's a really interesting product. Uh, uh, it's basically a, a, um, a carotenoid synthesis inhibitor. And you can see that, uh, I'll show you a picture in a minute, how evident it is. When you don't have carotenoids, you don't have chlor chloroplast, you don't have, you have a really white plant. It's an amazing, we call them bleaching agents. And um, the, uh, the Solacan really, again, well-established vineyards and orchards, they have to be at least two years old. And again, watch that sandy soil, make sure you don't get this into the root zone. Again, you will know when you got this in the root zone. Anyone use Solacan? And so it's pretty amazing. I'll show you a picture here in a minute. Um, again, use kind of the lower rates. It's really good. I found Solacan is really good on yellow nut sedge. So if you've got a yellow nut sedge problem, that's one you're going to want to add. And that's why I say, you know, don't, don't just stick with your standard uh, chemical regime. You know, think about switching out some of these products. Solacan is one to add if you haven't used it. Here's a picture. of You can see the whitening as it kind of comes out into the fringe a little bit and a few plants that were green in the beginning that have now lost all their chloroplast, right? and the carotenoids, and you can just see that amazing whitening. They really are strikingly white. And they really actually, I haven't never done it, but they say they fluoresce with a black light. So it's pretty, but it really stands out in the middle of the day. You can see it captured in that shot. But that's solar cam and a well-established well apple block. And again, nut sedge, if that's a problem, that's a really good, as well as a number of other broadleaf uh, weeds. A little bit weak on the, on the grasses, but a little bit of grass control too. It's, it really is a broad spectrum control product. The um, question, yes? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You don't want that uh, product to swirl up into that canopy. No, you sure don't. Uh, you, your spray technique's going to be good. Yeah, you, yeah. Now, that, was, that was made, uh, yeah, probably a few weeks earlier. Hopefully that branch wasn't weighing down quite so heavily at that point. But, yeah, you, you definitely want to, and you maybe, maybe you can tell, I may have actually stopped the sprayer there a little bit. Uh, uh, or if that's not shading, you can see I probably avoided spraying that branch a little bit. I did that by hand, so that makes it, makes it easy. Probably best to have those things tucked up better, right? The... Um, um, the, uh, I, I didn't mention 2,4-D, but 2,4-D is another product. If you, as long as you don't have a vineyard, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. But if you do have just fruit, 2,4-D is another one I, I typically could add in here. But these this products here, the diphenyl ethers, um, are also, we have a, a number of these products now. Um, some of them have to be used only dormant. Some of them we use um, um, in season. And so this group 14, the diphenyl ethers, the PPG or protox inhibitors, um, are really important. Uh, Gold, Galligan, they've got some different names now, Firepower. Um, they have to be made in the dormant, this group particularly, uh, um, the, uh, the oxyfluorophen group, um, has to be done in dormant application only. They're great for some of these products that we have out there like the Maristale. When's the best time to spray Maristale? It actually is about this time of the year. It's a small rosette out there. It's probably germinated in the fall. And you've got a really small, unnoticeable rosette. And, and if you don't, if you, you know, some of these applications, will we'll just take it out of the picture so you won't have to deal with it. And so if you're fighting mare's tail, you probably, of course, 2,4-D does a really good job on mare's tail too. Another um, group 14, uh, another chemistry group, uh, Flumoxazin, Chateau, um, hooded sprayer and less dormant. Um, so again, you can use Chateau into the season. It has a 60-day 60, 60 PHI though. So we have to watch that. And, um, and again, you don't want foliar absorption of these materials. These, they're, they're very, um, they are in this family, uh, they'll, they'll get into the plant and basically inhibit um, these, uh, these in the leaf tissue, uh, anything it gets on. So anyone that's used these, uh, this class of chemistry will recognize 
injury is always a concern. So we do need a hooded sprayer with Chateau uh, in season. Now dormant, you don't necessarily need that. There's no vegetation for it to, to land on. The, um, and then you have these, this interesting group here um, that has just came out uh, uh, again in this same group, 14s. And these, these are all very good broadleaf control products. All the 14s are your, typically your broadleaf control products. And so if you're having a problem with some of these troublesome broadleaves, we've got some really interesting tools. How many, anyone use AIM or Shark or Venue? These are great products to really clean up some of these weeds out there um, that escape, like escape mare's tail or uh, uh, I have, actually have a list here of venue where I, I looked, at, looked at some broad leaves. I'll show you here in a minute. Um, but any one of these would be fine. Um, Carfentures on ethyl and um, pyrofluflin ethyl, uh, aim shark, and then venue. You'll see they have zero or three days PHI, so very short windows. So you can be spraying right out there uh, with fruit. Again, you don't want this swirling up and you'll get injury on your, on your tissue. They, this, these products um, don't translocate too much on fruit tissue, so I wouldn't be as concerned with these products as I would with like a product like Chateau. Um, and uh, the, you do want to make sure you use what's on the label. I think Venue says crop oil concentrate. I think AIM and Shark, either or uh, NIS, non ionic surfactant, or crop oil concentrate. Again, hooded sprayer just so you don't swirl up in the canopy because you will see injury um, if you do let it swirl up into the canopy. The, um, I did, um, Venue came out from Nacino, and the sales rep was kind enough to give me something to try it, so I told him I'd run a little study for him. And I just, uh, this, I printed this a couple years ago. Um, some, some quick observations on the ability to suppress and even give season control with venue on some of those troublesome weeds. And you see that anything with an 80 or better um, is actually pretty good. Um, 90, 90 to 100 was season control, but anything above 80 was probably okay. And you can see at Knox horse nettle, and I've always had problems with horse nettle, and so venue or either shark or aim would probably do a nice job, but venue certainly did a nice job on horse nettle. It did a nice job on greenbrier. You have greenbrier problems. I was really fighting greenbrier, and I was really tickled to death with, with venue on greenbrier. And then um, um, I thought it did a pretty good job on mulberry. Who has mulberry? <laughs> yeah. So I thought, wow, finally something that hurts mulberry a little bit. So that's why these, again, broadleaf controlled. Very little grass control, um, but really 100% of morning glory, land squirter, pigweed, so you know, na nail some of these ones that we sometimes have escape with. So I thought, hey, these are really good tools and we probably should be incorporating these a little bit more. And we have these very, almost right up to fruit in time, we can put these products out. And they're very good actually in the summertime. Um, as long as you have good moisture and good weed activity, and um, you can get some really good uh, uh, control with these products. So again, that's really, and then again, another one, Trevex is also in this group 14, uh, Suflophenocil. Uh, uh, and um, again, very, very interesting, uh, make sure you use with, uh, uh, methylated seed oils or ammonium uh, sulfates or UAN solutions. So some really good guidelines for getting good, good uh, absorption to the tissue. You're really, really trying to kill these are post-control products. You got to get them in that tissue. And uh, again, very important to do that. Matrix, another one, a different, chem fem this actually goes to the sulfonylureas. Uh, we don't have very many sulfonylureas, but Matrix is one that works pretty well. Uh, make sure you have a, a one-year established orchard or vineyard. Uh, it's got a 14-day PHI. Uh, one thing about Matrix is it has a very good longevity, so you don't put it on there if you're getting ready to roll the orchard out or vineyard out. And then bioassays required, which means you have a product that could last more than six, more than a year, even 18 months if you. So make sure you calibrate well with Matrix. Um, Allion, uh, another one that uh, recently came out uh, about a few years now, and another one that's really good uh, uh, gives you a little bit more different spectrum of control. Um, uh, so a product that I haven't used much, but I know that uh, some people are are touting some pretty good, uh, I hope to look into Allion a little bit more. Of course, grass control post, the Cethoxidim or Select uh, Clethodim would be uh, what we want to do. I'm running out of time here. A few things I want to share with you. That's a picture of Napa Valley. Um, and again, you don't always have to use herbicides, but in this case, they were using a combination approach. Um, this is the Robert Madavi's vineyard, and that's his house. I thought that's kind of cool. And uh, there they are. They were actually tilling, so I stopped. I, I, the cultivator, the guy's out there somewhere. Maybe he's over in that corner. But he was freshly cultivating, so they used a combination approach of tillage as well as herbicides, which is another, another approach that can certainly be used, uh, especially in deep-rooted crops like vineyards. And so fumigation. Mike, I just want to throw up real quick the fumigation. So if you're thinking about fumigants are also very good weed control products as well as they control nematodes and disease complexes. And we're getting to the point where we get a number of these now we can inject. So if you're establishing fruit, you can actually uh, 
With a fumigation management plan and going through a lot of uh, hoops now, you can still use these products. And yes, chemi chemi uh, chemical injection is possible. So there's just a number of fumigation products. Uh, workers, real quick, uh, changes to the worker protection laws that you really have to pay attention to. Um, the, uh, um, uh, basically, training is required every year, and uh, new training material has to be there every two years. Uh, sprayers, now anyone that makes app application, except for family members, has to be 18. That's a change from 16 years old to 18 years old, so make sure you're aware of that with the workers that you might have out there. And they, if they're required to wear a respirator, they're required to become respirator fit tested. So that's a new, that's a new, that's a, something new for us. We never had that requirement for respirator fit testing. They could just wear the, wear the respirators like they're supposed to, but now respirator fit testing is required. Also, a gallon of water per worker that's uh, in the vicinity of a spray applications um, and three gallons for the applicator. So we have to have a lot more water, but potable water out there, uh, water tanks and things available for workers and things. One gallon per worker, three per sprayer or handler, and much more record keeping. So work, relook re at that worker protection. If you want to know about respirator fit testing, years ago we did a, a nice respirator fit uh, video here. You might take a look at that, but all the information about respirator fit testing is there. Medical clearance, you have to have med medical clearance, which means fit for duty. It's basically just going through your provider with a three-page OSHA sheet and then getting your respirator uh, fit testing, and you do that annually. And it's something you can do. Um, you, can do it, you can do it for someone. You can't do it for yourself, but you can learn how to do it, and all the information's online. That's it. <laughs> you bet. <laughs>